finally the announcer even started doing it. I said, well, here comes Daddy. Let's see what he's going to do this time. Too bad, Big Daddy. Try again. <laughs> Well, I'm Big Daddy Don Garlitz, and I've drag raced for the last 60 years. I started in 1950. That's a name that was hung on me at the Nationals in 1962. I arrived at the race with a gasoline dragster. NHRA was all gas at the time. I built this dragster at the request of Chrysler, which I have worked for since 1961. And I arrived there with my wife and two little toddlers. And I wasn't doing so good. And they started making fun of me. They said, oh, Daddy Garlitz is over the hill. I was like 32. And uh, he can't race anymore. And I'd make runs and have trouble. And they just, finally the announcer even started doing it. They said, well, here comes Daddy. Let's see what he's gonna do this time. Too bad, Big Daddy, try again. And uh, it was, it was, I was becoming the laughing stock. And then I got in the car and I went 180 miles an hour, 0.36, new world record. And the announcer, Bernie Partridge said, well, I guess we're gonna have to call him Big Daddy from now on. Associated Press picked it up, it went worldwide. The following year, the strips were announcing Big Daddy Don Garlitz is coming, it's been there ever since. The swap rut name was quite different. That was a slur hurtled at me by Seto Pastoian from Detroit. He put an ad in Drag News and it said, it's no wonder they call you the swamp rat. You're in this sport for what you can get. And you don't care who you hurt, just as long as you make a buck out of it. It's a half a page ad and I got real upset and my buddy there was making a film about drag races. Nah. That's a good name. I'll have my artist draw one. So they draw the little rat that you see around here, and it's been there ever since. Well, I've, I'm innovative. I think ahead of my time. My dad thought ahead of his time. He, he was like that. I could look at the cars. I went north in 57. And I saw the cars that were the championship cars, and I saw my car, and I could see what the progression was from my car to their car, and then I imagined what the next progression was, and I built that car, actually modified my car to be like that. Most of it was all modified in those days. Didn't build a brand new car. And it went 176, which was a new world record. And then, of course, I wasn't satisfied with that. Then I modified that car to, even better and it went 180 and so on and so on. First thing you know, I built new cars and almost all of my cars were ahead of their time and you can prove this even today. Go into my museum and look at Swamp Rat 34, a top fuel dragster built in 1993 and is still the most modern top fuel dragster in the entire world. They haven't even caught up to my design yet. Now they're just now starting to put canopies on them. I've had canopies since 1986. I put the canopy on for safety, but it also was for wind resistance. It, it made it a slicker car. Well, the, back in the day, in the 50s and the 60s, the Eastern racers were more primitive. And the reason for that was California was the hotbed of the aircraft industry in World War II, and that's where all this spawned from. The, the mechanics and the people came back to California and the war was over, the plant shut down, but all these machines and all this technology and all this knowledge was there, and it had to be funneled into something. And one of the things it went into was racing, and drag racing was part of that. So that's why they had such nice stuff out there. It was, they, they had the best equipment, the best materials, and the best guys to put it all together. We didn't have that so much in the East, but some of us caught up pretty good. And uh, first thing you know, we could run as good as they did. 
the rules. You can't have any of that anymore. I went to Gainesville, you know, in 1986 with the, the Swamp Rat 30 with the enclosed front wheels. Had all kinds of trouble throwing the belts off of them, beating up the bodies and all. And they continued to let me run, and I won the race. They would never allow that today under any circumstances. If I showed up with a car like that, it would never even pass inspection. You'd just be, they just send you right out of there. Everything has to be just, they are spec cars. You could take a part off of one dragster, take it down the line and bolt it on another one. It's all the same. It's all about the tuning. That's the only difference now. And, of course, with a thousand foot racing and 3.3 times for the run, reaction time means everything. There's no innovation now. Nothing. In fact, there's a rule that says nothing new. And if you do have something new and innovative, you have to test it. It has to be approved by an HRA. And before you can put it on your car, it has to be available to all your competitors. So why would anybody do anything? It'd be stupid. Just the tuning is the innovation now. Who can tune the most horsepower out of them? And, uh, I mean, they've got some tricks how to, how to get it. <laughs> Well, the best track that I've ever run at, and the one I like the best, is Gainesville. And the one reason for that is most every quarter-mile track is good. It's got good traction. But Gainesville has over 5,000 feet of shutoff, and that is really an important thing for a really fast car. If all the tracks had been like Gainesville, we'd still be running quarter-mile, and the dragsters would be going 350 miles an hour and it would be just fine. I drove my car at Gainesville, Swamp Rat 34, another 150 feet past the lights and reached 340 miles an hour and still just coasted to a stop. And it's so long and so nice. Now they've built some concrete tracks that are just as good as far as traction goes, but Gainesville to me is the safest and best track in the whole world. Well, the first slingshot came about on Jacksonville Beach, and there was a guy come out there, and he said they raced on the sand. So he put a seat way in back of the rear wheels, and that was the actual first slingshot. Now, he didn't get any credit for that because it wasn't a national deal and it wasn't on pavement. Mickey Thompson did the same thing in California for pavement racing, and he sat in back of the rear wheels, and of course, then it caught right on. I don't know who the second guy was, but when I built my first dragster, I sat in back of the rear wheels, just like Mickey Thompson did, for traction. Because we got to remember, the tires were only five and six inches wide then, the slicks, and uh, that and this old hard rubber, and uh, no spray tracks, none of that stuff. And of course, the tires. Finally, when we got this, is what brought the rear engine car revolution not only my foot getting blown off and not me spending a lot of time with it developing there have been rear engine cars forever but they didn't work because they didn't get the traction well we didn't need the traction like we needed before we needed it down course but the, the wing took care of that but the traction off the line that we no longer needed and the slingshot was actually a detriment in 1969 and 70. You can look at the pictures of the cars, they got two and 300 pounds of lead bolted on the front. Well, immediately, that was one of the reasons my car was so successful. I moved the driver from in back of the wheels, put him in front of the engine in a much safer spot for sure, took all that lead off the front and actually went to the line at about 1,200 pounds where the slingshots were going to the line 15 and 1,600 pounds. Well, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure out who's gonna win that race. My fiercest competitor. Uh, if the first one that comes to mind immediately is Shirley Muldowney. It wasn't a very long deal, but it was fierce while it lasted because she absolutely had to win. The Snake was another one that was a tough competitor, and he didn't stay very long. A few, he got beat a few times, and then he went into Funny Car. But the longest one was the Greek. The Greek raced from, oh my God, from 59, and is still racing in Top Fuel, and we made, we made more match races with the Greek than anybody else. And he, 
There was a period of time when he was unbeatable to me because I had the 426 Hemi, which wasn't running good. And in 23 straight runs, the Greek won. Nobody ever had a record like that. But then when I got it straightened out and got it running good, then it all went back to normal. The, the win-lose with the, the Shirley's about a 50-50, and the, the snake, I beat him a lot more than that. And he'll tell you right to his face, I drove him out of dragsters into funny cars. <laughs> and God bless him. <laughs> we were racing Don Perdome at uh, US 30. It was a match race. He had a dragster and uh, a lightweight dragster. Swingle was driving at the time. I was recovering from the, the foot accident. They beat Perdome. Of course, we were driving this real lightweight spindly car like my cars always were. And Perdome takes off all the body off the front of his, and not realizing that that was part of the weight that holds it down when it leaves the line. So he pulled all the body off to try to win the last round. because We'd already won two. And the darn thing goes into a wheel stand, a big wheel stand, slams down on the thing and destroys the front end and the wheels and everything. And Swingle says to him, he says, Snake, if I'd have known you wanted to win that bad, would you just lift it for one run? You should have said something. Well, nothing would make a guy madder than to be told that we could have let him win one, you know. Oh, he got furious. I want to be remembered of the guy that did it my way. You know, there's a lot of times, you know, that I bit off more than I could chew. And, you know, I live with it. You know, they've got the sidewinder, I got the streamliners in there. And, but then, you know, I, I, I want to be remembered as a guy that developed that rear engine car and made it work where it was usable. Everybody would had them before. None did anything, even I had them. And that thing saved some serious lives. And so that's really important to me. And then the other thing is naturally this museum, because this is preserving the history of the sport. You can go, we'll be able to come back here years and years from now and look at it and say, yeah, this is how they did it. Here it is right here. Here it is. I mean, they, you can't argue with the artifacts. They tell it like it is. And uh, that's, that's, that's my contribution.